This is for the free thinkers, the curious beings that swim upstream, who see possibilities, not problems, that learn from the past, live by the present, and create the future. This is the I Love Ugly Audio Show. Welcome to the I Love Ugly Audio Show. I'm Valenti Nozic, the creative director and founder of I Love Ugly. Since this is the first ever episode of a show, we thought it would be appropriate to give you guys a deep history lesson on the brand. I sit down with our digital director, Will, who digs deep, asking me questions about I Love Ugly's humble beginnings, the biggest highlights the brand's experienced, the challenges I've learnt along the way, as well as a bunch of lessons and stories I think you will find interesting and valuable. Enjoy. I Love Ugly. When did it start and why? Um... Yeah, it started back in 2008. One of the main reasons I started it was because I needed to do something because I had an une- unexpected daughter come come along into my life. And um, at the time, at the time I was a little bit lost. I was at university, didn't know what I wanted to do, but I had this idea of doing something creative and using the words, I love ugly as the label for it. At the time, it wasn't clothing, it was actually an art magazine originally. Right. And, then, and then from there, I was like, well, this is, this is gonna be hard to monetize and make money from. So I felt that the natural progression from there was clothing and I had a whole bunch of illustrations which I was tinkering around with and I put the illustrations onto t-shirts and then I Love Ugly was born. I actually tried to, I tried to sc- screen print those two shirts myself originally and they turned out absolute garbage. Garbage, And I realized it's like, okay, there's certain things that I need to be doing. And which is basically, you know, having the vision and the creative part and there's certain things I need to outsource like the, the screen printing and the manufacturing of the garments and the sewing part and construction of the garment. Mm. I just stared away from that. And so, was there like an entre- entrepreneurial kind of spirit within you or like where did the desire to actually like start a business come from? Absolutely. My dad was an immigrant from Croatia, uh, self-employed. He basically started uh, an orchard and growing fruit and, and grapes and then started a wine company with his brother. My grandfather was, same, was the same. All the Croatian immigrants that came to New Zealand basically didn't work for the man. They started their own thing and they just saw there was a lot of opportunity here and they were just said to themselves, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pounce on this and naturally yeah, that cool. rubbed off on me growing up on that. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't like I straight away said, oh, I'm gonna mm-hmm. start my business. I was doing jobs here and there. I did all sorts of jobs, the most studious jobs. I, was, I worked at McDonald's, I worked at Kmart, I pumped gas at Shell service station. I I was digging drains. All those things were, as much as I hated them, they were an absolute blessing because they motivated me to not go down that track and to pursue my, you know, my creative endeavors and try to utilize my my talents and skills, which I had in in creative. So yeah, entrepreneurship was, it just, it, it just stemmed from that. I just, I saw a little, I saw a little window of opportunity. I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna feel this out and I'm gonna experiment a little bit. And then yeah, look what happened. Yeah, cool. And so, um, what 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 job did you have while, when you very first started doing the t-shirts? When I first started, I so when I had my daughter in two thousand eight, I had to. I was doing a few art jobs, like for Adidas Originals. I did a few commission paintings and stuff for their store, and then um, that wasn't very sustainable, especially to right. support a child and, and my wife who couldn't work at the time. So I ended up basically getting a job at a bank, being a bank teller, and that was soul destro- absolutely soul destroying. Yeah. Just work- working for a corporate, and I'm the most anti-corporate mind, the way my mind structured, you can imagine. And as good as the money was, it was just soul destroying. Mm-hmm. And that just motivated the shit out of me to really chase this dream that I had. And that's what kept me up you know, till two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And I often hear people saying, I don't have time and this and that, it's bullshit. You know, we've all got 24 hours of it in a day and it's your choice whether or not you want to, you know, watch movies and, and sleep. And in my, in my case, I just used, you know, my situation as motivation to make, to get myself out of this, to work myself out of this. Yeah, right. And so um, how long were you like doing that until you started to realize, okay, I'm, I'm onto something here with the t-shirts? 
like what was the next step from there? So you're printing the t-shirts, you're still working, yep. um, and then what was like the next progression from there? Yeah, the next step was I got to get out of this bank and I got to get something a little bit more aligned with me. And 2008 was right, right in the middle of uh, GFC, for those that don't know what that means, sure. global financial crisis. So jobs were tough, especially design jobs, and a lot of people weren't hiring. A lot of design companies weren't hiring people that didn't have design skills. In right. my case, I didn't have design skills. So anyway, I ended up buying a lot of my t-shirts from a blank t-shirt company, and then I just one day asked if there's any work, and eventually they gave me some work, and next minute I was a t-shirt picker in, in the factory floor picking blank t-shirts for $35,000 a year. Yeah. And um, so I was in that, and as you know, it was tough work and it wasn't good money, but at least I was in an environment. I saw people mm. coming in and buying t-shirts and I was having discussions and I was kind of speaking the language of where I needed to be with yeah. other people and getting inspired off those people. But anyway, I was doing that for, I was doing picking t-shirts and doing my side gig uh, for about a year. I was selling those t-shirts off a website called Trade Me and for those people outside of New Zealand, Trade Me is like the equivalent to eBay. Mm. And I was basically jacking other people's you know, hashtags and keywords to get attention onto my product. And then that started to kind of take off and people used to buy, buy the product. At that time I was producing 20, 30 units. People would rock up to my house, text me, <laughs> give me cash, buy the product. And eventually it started to get out. More friends started to wear it. More people started to wear it. After that, a few you know boutiques started to pick up the product and stock the product, and at that point, I was like, okay, this thing's this thing's got some yeah. legs. I want to cool. I want to develop this a little bit, and I did that for 2008 to to about mid mid 2009, I believe. Right. And then I was like, okay, cool. I got I I was at a crossroads where I got to make a decision. Yeah. And so, obviously, starting a business, um, the stats of people. Um, having a successful business for a long period of time are pretty small. Like the mindset that's required <clears throat> when starting a business is mm -hmm. obviously um, not everybody has it. Mm -hmm. Take me through kind of like your mindset when you were in that beginning period because I know like starting is often the hardest part mm -hmm. of business. How was, you, how was your mindset? Were you equipped with everything you needed then or were like times tough for you? Absolutely not. By all means, I had no idea about personal development. I'd never right. word for, never heard the word personal development. Um, starting for me was the easiest part. I just started, and in some cases, it was probably looking back. It was probably I started too quickly and too easily, and I figured stuff out mm. as I went along. Um, but the but the mindset part of it, absolutely not. All I had was a dream and a yeah. vision, and that's what kept me up at night. And when I'd be tinkering around you know, till two o'clock in the morning, I'd be visualizing people in America wearing I Love Ugly. Right. And that was my mindset. So That's I was sick. just a thinker. I was not, a, not afraid to think big. Mm. And skills, mindset, I wasn't equipped with that. All I yeah. had was a big vision. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's important as well in a learning lesson for other people. It's like, if you've got something, like anything, everybody's got something, just pounce on that, latch mm. onto that and that can be the seed to growing something big. And in my case, it was a vision. Yes, yeah, so. And so once the boutique retailers started to pick up the T-shirts, kind of what happened from there? Like, what was your next step? Were you wanting to go online or were you wanting to make your own store? Or mm. what was it then? Well, back then, online wasn't really a thing. Like, right. no one, you know, we're talking 10, 11 years ago. Obviously, it's seems foreign yeah, but now. no one was doing online mm -hmm. um it was it was retailers and also social media was in its infancy as well yeah. so i had to kind of figure out a way where i could get in front of an audience uh you know that would be most likely to buy and in my case it was it was wholesalers and boutiques the margin was shit, made no money <laughs> but it put me in front of people yeah, yeah. and it helped helped to establish a brand mm -hmm. in the area and i just basically did that for a good chunk of time and just reached out to every wholesaler. I was, re I was relentless and mm. looking back at some of the emails and the lookbooks which I presented, they were pretty pretty horrible, but some, we people, start somewhere. some people picked it up, absolutely. And I just did that, I did that for a bit. And then Facebook started to emerge and I was one of the earlier mm. adapters on it. I grew up, I was fortunate to grow up in the era of social media and I started kind of tinkering around with it and I was like, oh yeah, this is a pretty cool platform to speak to people directly. 
and I just just started to push out things through social media, f through Facebook, and it was quite quite a cool platform to develop a personality for the brand mm. about like the little kind of quirks and nuances which I wanted to convey through the brand. It was mm. quite a cool, you know, playground for that. And I did that for a bit. And then after a while, I was like, shit, okay, well, online, that's definitely something I want to explore. Yeah. I started a website. I got some coder that I met through some chat room or whatever to, to code it up. And all, all, it was, all it was was a lookbook page yeah. with information and drove people to other wholesalers. Right, so they couldn't actually buy it. They couldn't the buy it, but they could kind of see, see it. it they could see it. And then yeah. it got to a point where it's like, and this is where my, the entrepreneurial side of me woke up. It's like, okay, cool, these wholesalers uh, are making, making money, all the mm. money, and they're not doing the most fantastic job. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to be doing what I'm doing, picking two shirts forever. I want to build a career. How can I? How can I monetize this? And that's when the whole online thing kind of right. started to be taken more seriously. And then also the you know the first first serious look about in, into opening my own store. Mm. And so during this time, you you mentioned that you had um, your dad as like kind of an influence in the business world. Yeah. Did you have any other kind of input from other people, any mentors or anything like that, or were you kind of going solo and kind of learning solo? As you went? I didn't know the whole concept of mentorship, all right. of that. Just you remember, I said, you remember I was saying like personal development and all these tools and tactics and all this stuff that's out there today didn't exist in my yeah. world back then. It was literally do, learn on the fly, fix, and hope to God that it works yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was it. But I think that obviously I was inspired by people doing stuff, mm. and I, you know, I really vibed off that, but I didn't have the balls or the courage to go up to anybody and ask yeah. them the questions. I, when I was working at the Blank Apparel Company, I, I watched him closely mm. about what he was doing and this okay. and that. But so I you had really, some kind of influence yeah, there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's something as well, like people think that a mentor is someone where you meet up every Tuesday at two o'clock yeah. and you've got a range of questions that, which you ask them. Man, you can find mentors and everybody in YouTube and books and absolutely everything. Watching so your right. watching your, your uncle, the way he built his business, like there's so many different ways mm. where you can use people as a mentor. Absolutely. And so, okay, so the boutique is starting to get picked up. You know, you're spreading the, the lookbooks online to a lot yeah. of different people. Um, at what point did you jump into your, your own store? I, got, I jumped into my store when I got picked up by ASOS. ASOS, the UK website back in the day, opened up a, like a boutique side yeah. of the business and they picked it up and they put like a $20,000 $20, order for it. And I was like, oh Whoa. shit, okay. This is where yeah. this is where the kind of light bulb went on. I was like, this has legs. If yeah. I'm getting traction, and at that time, ASOS was like the pinnacle. If you were on ASOS, yeah. you were like the boss. Yeah, and then yeah. got on ASOS, and then New Zealand media started picking up on right. it. And, I, and then all of a sudden, people started to take I Love Ugly seriously, even though, even though the quality and everything was, in my opinion, subpar. Yeah, uh, there was something that they were attracted to, yeah. and. After that, I was like, okay, cool. I re-looked at the whole wholesale thing. I was like, nah, I gotta go. I gotta go direct to consumer. So I opened up a shop with my wife. We had $20,000 and this is where I came to the crossroads. We had $20,000 saved up and it's like, I, can't, I can work for somebody else for the rest of my life mm. uh, and just save and do this thing on the side or I can just basically and, and be dipping my toe in or I can go just fully in, yeah, dive yeah. all in. So I took the 20K, we found the little shop, we lived upstairs with our daughter. How did you know where to find the shop? Man, we had no idea what we were no, doing. We yeah. just looked for, A I'm shop. pretty sure we just <laughs> picked and, and grabbed the first vacant shop. Yeah, we yeah. didn't even read the lease, signed it right yeah. then and there, like that afternoon. So did you and feel so, like you were taking a massive risk? Yeah, then? I was nervous, but that's what my wife kind of brought to the table was she always had nice. this courageousness and I was a little bit kind of boxed, mm. maybe because of my background. And she kind of forced me to think big and we signed a dotted line and, and that's kind of what I mean. I just committed yeah. and then I had to sort. And yeah. you know, if you throw your heart over the line, the rest will follow and yeah, that's what you happened. Had no choice. But then we had the shop. What am I gonna call it? I Love Ugly wasn't established at the time. So I decided to call it something a little bit ambiguous. I called it Broken Puppet. How am I gonna get 
how am I going to get attention? I'll get attention by importing brands, mm. international brands, which I wanted to align with. In my case, it was Norse Projects, and I had Para from Amsterdam, and a whole bunch of other yeah. you know, Aussie brands align alongside Isle of Ugly. So that attracted customers through. People came in, but they liked Isle of Ugly. Yeah. It was cheaper. They loved the fact. They loved the story. They loved the fact that the name, the you know, the product was different. Yeah. And did that for a while. That so was, was it just t-shirts? Still it was just t-shirts. No, nah, a little bit of cut and sew, pants, okay. this and yeah. that. That year was the hardest year of my life. Like sure. I had, you know, and that's what I was saying. I went all in. Yeah. And then I tried to sort it out. But trying to grow a label, run a multi-brand store, first year of business. Yeah. It just everything, everything basically came to a head, and I fell into a deep state of depression. I wasn't looking after myself, my health. Everything was just neglected, yeah. and I was basically, oh yeah, I was thinking if there's a pill out there, I'll take it yeah. to feel better. Do you and that think, was, yeah, that, do you was think that was a result of not, you know, trying to just do it all on your own strength? I was a result of also doing it on my own strength and not knowing what the hell I was doing. Yeah. And when I hit breaking point, we went to Amsterdam for our wedding anniversary, and I got super inspired. That's where I came up with the idea of a Zespi. Yeah, and then. I also realized it's like, how am I going to run this business and do this creative side? But when I came back, that's when I basically hit, hit, hit rock bottom. Yeah. And I just said, okay, there's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. And like, the first book I picked up was, I think it was, a, and this is, my, this is the first step into personal development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First time I've ever been exposed was a Tim Ferriss four hour work week. Yeah, good, and good. it was random. But although I didn't obviously agree with all the principles, mm, it started it to awaken, yeah. awaken the side of me that had, had been dormant for a long, long time. And then it just, the penny, the penny yeah. dropped. I was like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta make a change in my health, my well-being, yeah. the way I look at business, the way I do business. I gotta simplify my business. I gotta, you know, do the financials, do all the boring shit that people neglect, thinking that mm. if they do good design, they're gonna basically yeah. design their way out of a good mess. Product. That's the product. That's when I really realized yeah. that's not true. And so, um, obviously, that's a really crazy time for you. Yeah. Um, when did so you mentioned the Zespi before, an yeah. iconic product in itself? When when did you when did that get brought into the market, and kind of what did people think of it? Yeah. Back then? So, it was pretty crazy. I was in Amsterdam. I was I was high, and I, you know, start to see things just differently yeah, as, yeah. as you do. You know, it <laughs> alters your state. Um, and then I was like, fuck, I couldn't get this image of these pants out of my head until I came back to New Zealand three weeks later or so. And then I came back and I found the seamstress and tried to explain to her and did the prototype. Took about 10 prototypes. The first were right. whack, but kept going. And just remember, I couldn't sew. I yeah. could see it in my head. So I was le really trying to learn to uh, be articulate and explain yeah. and delegate. 10 samples later, got the product. Bingo, this is, and so the factory this is producing pant. the sample, that was locally? Yeah, yeah, so I got the sample and then I had to find the factory. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, which yeah, was yeah, local, yeah. All, yeah, local. all local. All this, at this point, all local. And then I was retailing these pants at 250 bucks, I believe. Yeah. And I was running around like an idiot all around Auckland City, finding the trims, the buttons, the cords, yeah. the fabric, you know, That's hoping crazy. that they'll give me credit because I had no money. Yeah. And I got it to market and... And what did people think? People loved it. Yeah. People hated it. But what we did really <laughs> smart was we branded the product. We called it the Zespi. Right. Everybody was just releasing, oh, the new Chino pant in beige. Yeah, we yeah, were like, yeah. this is the Zespi in coffee color. Yeah. This is the Zespi in tan. This is the Zespi in like midnight black. You yeah. know, we gave it personality. And, and honestly, within, within a short, short amount of time, it just started to cotton on really quickly. But... The price point was too high, yeah. and then that's when we started to basically like relook at that and just relook at the basic fundamentals mm. like price point. And, right, um, and is that where things started to take off, or was it still? Yeah, so just rewinding it back a little bit. So year one, when I got that shot, broken puppet, I had that had that breakdown. Came back, realized I had to simplify, so I decided to shut down the shop. Yeah. And then solely focus. And then I had a month or a couple of months just to get my health together and my head together. Oh right, so you completely shut. I the completely shop. shut the shop. True. I kept the label alive because yeah. the label was it, what 
which was something I knew was going to propel yeah. me into future. Yeah. Yeah. Multi-brand retail was difficult. Yeah. I wanted to fo focus on vertical retail where I manufacture yeah. and design and I bring it to consumer. to consumer. And we, so we had, uh, you know, we did that. And then I was like, okay, cool. I, and then ASOS picked us up and I was like, okay, cool. If I want to do this and take it to the next level, I need to basically figure out what I'm really good yeah. at. And I, I got to figure out what needs to be done. Yeah. And I got to figure out and find a person that can do that stuff mm. that I'm not good at yeah. and that are good at. So I had a, had a friend at the time who was doing his own project and that went under for numerous reasons. And he was available and he was hungry and young and ambitious and entrepreneurial like me. And I was like, hey, come on board and let's yeah. do this thing. And I can't really pay you maybe a hundred bucks or so. Yeah. And then if you stick around for a while, I'll give you the opportunity to buy in. He came in and I did my thing and I was you know, really good at branding and marketing and designing product and you know, having a vision and yeah. a direction of where we wanted to go as a business. And then he fixed, he did basically the operations of logistics, the liaising with the factories and watching margins and you know, setting up a bit of a, a financial infrastructure to the business. And that just you know, allowed, allowed me to do what I was good at and him and as a result of it, yeah, and we we're focused, and we we're focused on the right things. The business grew as a result, and and then we also went to China as well. And our price at point. At what point were you? So had you started selling to the consumer again? Yes. So we had. Um, Is this online? Yes. Yeah, so we still had wholesale because we still needed. Okay, yes, still needed right. cash flow. We got a Russian guy, Nikolai, still a mate today. It was 50 bucks a week, I believe we were paying him. We built a website from scratch on Magento. Yeah. And it was broken, but man, we did it. We were one of the consumer. first yeah. in the country. I remember we were on the news for it. One of the first in the country. And honestly, it just worked. It yeah. just, not immediately. It didn't have that hockey stick kind of design. growth. We were onto something. And, uh, and then at this time, you know, our Facebook was getting well established. I, I believe Instagram was in its infancy. And we just worked it, man. Like yeah. that was our, that was our thing. Just worked it. And then, yeah, we, yeah, did the online thing and changed our price point. And yeah, it started to, it started to kind of snowball from there. And so, at what point does the first store come into play? The first Isle of Ugly store came into play when it was November. I think November two thousand, maybe two thousand eleven, two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. It was in a little suburban area, city fringe, called Mount Eden, top of Mount Eden Road. Right. And it was the same thing. It's like we'd been burnt with wholesalers. Yeah. Wholesalers are delaying payments. And it's like, okay, we need to, we need to just do a store and mm. you know, get in front of our customer. And, and we opened it up and it, was, it looked like shit, like bear crates. It was all DIY to just put together on a $2,000 budget, yeah. if that, probably a $1,000 budget. And we launched beginning or mid-November, and it was the perfect timing. It was the market was craving mm. product like ours, and and also in a in-store retail experience. And we drove the traffic for our social media and our mail mail database, right. and it just really started to kind of pop off from there and locally. And so, and then we, and the website was also bubbling away yeah, as well. Yeah, cool. And so, what was the difference between? Um, you and your mindset and your well-being and everything from Broken Puppet to um, starting I Love Ugly. Like, were you in a complete different headspace or were you yeah. investing in yourself at that point? Yeah, I was investing in myself, but not obviously not to the extent I do today or yeah. in the last few years, but I was getting better. And I think I was being less, I was being a lot more humble, right. humble about things and not thinking I was a shit. And yeah. I was actually going out to people that were more successful than me and mm. asking them questions and actually applying yeah, cool. what they were saying to me. that's so important, right? That's so important, absolutely. And even nowadays, so many people come up to me and ask for advice and I tell them exactly what to do and they don't do it. Yeah. Like to me, it's like, come on, dude, like I'm saving you five years, 10 years yeah. and a lot of money and mistakes and pain and time. Mm. And, um, and at that, time, that point, yeah, I was... My one of my mates, best friend still to today, he gave me Tony Robbins like a bootleg audio, and I was mm -hmm. like, "What is this shit? This guy's whack. He's off his infomercials." It was Awaken the Giant Within or something. Yeah, it was an yeah, audio yeah. book, Old school ass. whack Good ass. Book. And I was yeah. like, "This guy's whack. I'm not listening to this." Yeah. Listen to it, and then this guy Brian Tracy called Eat Eat the Frog, yeah. talking about time management and 
doing the most difficult task mm. first. Yeah. And I was like, that's interesting. And yeah. then I remember me and my business partner at the time would be going, we'd be talking till like three, four in the morning mm. and we'd be driving around all the wealthy areas of Auckland and being like, this is, we're gonna have this one day. Yeah. And we were just <laughs> driven, but we were only driven by wealth. Yeah. And I think that was a real fundamental mistake. Obviously, when you're young, you're driven by material yeah, things. Be, yeah. And, but that gave me the boost. And, True. you know, I had two kids by that point. You know, I had a son and a daughter. And my, obviously, my wife was a full time mom. So yeah. I had to provide. So, of course, you had to be financially driven. And I think that also made me, forced me to make more commercial decisions because. I've come to realize it's easy to be cool and boutique. Yeah. It's actually hard to be bigger yeah. and have a sustainable business. Mm. And that was a real shift in my mindset as well, just as I started to grow and mature as a, as a businessman. Yeah. And so when did the, when did the next um, kind of stores come about? Like at what point were you like, okay, we've got the Mount Eden store, we've got online cranking. Yeah. Like what was the next step there? Was it more stores or was it scale online? You it was, yeah. yeah, both. It was, it was online. Online was starting to, you know, we started to get traction on big reputable websites and blogs like Hypebeast and High Snobiety and Slamix Hype at the time. And that started to kind of pop off, which drove traffic and mm. demand and opportunities and distributors for the online aspect. But then for the store, which was obviously a winning formula, we were like, the store's too small. It was 30 square meters, which is, you know, 300 square feet. Yeah. It was tiny, but we were, that store was punching above its weight. True. We did, our record day in that store was about $15,000 on the Saturday. Ooh. It was unbelievable. It was packed, lines outside. Yeah. And we're like, this is ridiculous. Like, we're, you know, to people turning away customers and business. So mm. we decided to open up a store down in Newmarket, which was about 10 minutes away, which was a bit more of a, kind of high-end shopping yeah. district of Auckland City. And open there, it was 100 square meters, so it was mm. pretty much more than triple the size yeah. in the room. And just, yeah, just we spent a bit of, bit of money into it. I designed the whole thing from scratch and worked with the fabricator, and it just worked. It was big, yeah. roomy, we could offer more, people could breathe and move in it. Yeah. And that was, the, that was the start of a bit of a retail journey. And were, you, were your factory still local at this point? No, no, we were fully in China. Fully in China. Yeah. At what yeah. point did you kind of make the switch? We did the switch in when we opened the first store yeah. and we started to get direct feedback from the customers and a lot of them were like, it's cool brand, this and that, but it's too expensive. Yeah. I can't afford $250 pants. <laughs> Fuck, who can afford a $250 yeah. pair of pants? You know, and then, uh, so we just basically switched it and we, we brought them down to about $130 New Zealand, which is around maybe $90, $95 yeah. US, I believe. And that just, that, we, and yeah, what we, was that, we what was that process like? Obviously, you probably might not have gone and been dealing with China before. Yeah. What was that experience like? Because obviously right now with the internet and the way everything is, it's, you know, the barriers are a lot smaller than they yeah. were back then. Yeah. What was it like? starting to deal with Chinese factories. Well, like, it, was just, through that. Well, it was just mindset, right? Yeah. Like there's this misconception that China is a ripoff of quality shit. They take your money and run. Yeah. It was all baloney. And we were like, okay, how can we de-risk this? So we just used an agent that right. already had the established factories yeah. and relationships. Went through the agent and basically they dealt with it all and all we were doing was the IP and the design. Oh. And we took a bit of a margin hit, but we de-risked the business. So yeah, I'd rather de-risk the business and take a margin hit, then yeah. have all the risk. And, yeah. and so the quality coming back, you were it was great. stoked with that? Yeah, it was phenomenal. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. And it was, we were saving so much time because it was yeah. a one-stop shot. The quality was, you know, that's what they do. They manufacture, our uh, specialists. And so you mentioned that kind of, as you were starting, social media was kind <clears> of <throat> in its infancy. I know that you guys managed to build like a massive following yeah. on that. Like, take me through like when you kind of identified the social media thing could actually be something. Yeah, we did a competition called, what was it called? Like the pill jar, I believe, pill. And we put a whole bunch of little sherbets in this, in this jar. And we had a vinyl sticker on it saying, <laughs> the pill jar, guess how many pills yeah. in the jar? Yeah. And then the winner will get $200 voucher. We got thousands, 
thousands and thousands of comments and we boosted it obviously yeah. and i was like man this is unbelievable to reach and mm. engage with this amount of people was just like where yeah. how else can you do that and at that point that uh, you know all the engagement is at a very high level when it, yeah when it was at that time absolutely and it was a lot of it was organic yeah, free yeah. or if you both if you spent 10 bucks you it, would, bang for it buck, would be yeah. ridiculously the return you get on that yeah and that's when we were you know there's one stage where i love ugly was i think i believe it was in the southern hemisphere they had the top five ranked most engaging and popular instagram facebook pages yeah. sorry at the time, and it was, I think it was McDonald's, I Love Ugly, and then BMW, <laughs> yeah, da, 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 da. Good company to be yeah. in. Yeah, it was fantastic. So, and we, you know, from that, we started to get a lot of media attention and this and that. But I just, I just became a, I just became a student of the, mm. of the medium and people asked, how do you do it and this and that, and I just researched the crap out of it and did a lot of experimentation, wasn't afraid of making failures, wasn't, you know, too cool to try out new things. Yeah. A lot of people criticize us of being whack and sellouts, but mm. as I said earlier, it's it's easier. Yeah, it's easier to stay small and cool. Yeah. Um, and so, Wendy, you've got the <coughs> new market store. You've got the Mount Eden store. Yeah. Um, online's cranking. Yeah. Um, thanks, thankful to social. Yeah. Um, what was the next point from there? Wellington store. Wellington. So we started a pop up down in Wellington, which is the capital city of New Zealand for those outside of New Zealand. And uh, we did a little pop-up store, tried it, it worked. And then bang, just opened up a, a proper bricks and mortar. We've had, we've been there for about six, seven years now. It's been so, amazing. What about what about after that? After that, How many was, did you have at the peak in New Zealand? And then we had another one in Auckland. Yeah. So we had three in Auckland, one in Wellington. And then we, all, we were, and then at the time, online was really cranking, yeah. like, I'm talking cranking, and it was all from US mainly, True. which it still is today. Yeah. And how big was how big a role did wholesale play? Wholesale was also States. getting really big as yeah, well. Right. So this is also a problem: is we were getting big in online, big in our own retail, and big on wholesale. Yeah. And distributors were which coming good, along. Which is a good problem. It's a good have. problem to have, but at the same time, you need to do things, do things in steps and stages, yeah. because all of them have different financial like require a different yeah. financial infrastructure. And we didn't really have that financial acumen to be able to do it properly. Yeah. But anyhow, after, the, the, after the, the success of all the New Zealand stores and the success of the online through US, we were, we were looking at where all the traffic coming, was coming from. It was yeah. from California. So we're like, okay, once again, yeah. my mindset, ambitious mindset, we're gonna go there, put our finger on the map, booked a flight to LA, got the bank facility set up so the bank was loaning us some money, hired a car, didn't know what the hell we were doing, drove around LA, met this dude from Stamped LA, yeah. which is a, a Californian brand. He showed us all the dope spots. There's one spot on La Brea Avenue next to, like just down from Stussy and Union, yeah. Los Angeles, vacant, vacant shop, called up the guy, met him for coffee that afternoon had to spend half an hour convincing him that we were the owners. We were from New Zealand. Right, we onto, yeah, yeah. He, how uh, old were you at this point? How old was I? 26, right. 27. And we basically basically convinced him. We had to convince his daughter, yeah. bought her a gift, told her where, you know, <laughs> gave him the pitch pitch. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. accepted, got the, got the lease signed, and it was a dog's breakfast, a store we had to spend we had to spend half a million dollars on the store. It was ridiculous wow. to set it all up, which in hindsight was the most foolish thing. And yeah, we set it up and opened up the store. And the first day we had a queue outside. We did $17,000 US on the opening day. True. And then um, I, yeah, I left, at, I left that night back to New Zealand and just tapped myself on the back and yeah. before we you did it. And it was, it was one hell of a high. Yeah, it was, it was just crazy. It was too fast. It was yeah. just going too fast. And, you know, it's what I've really learned, you know, it is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Mm. I never really understood that concept until I yeah. basically was in the sprint. And being in a sprint, obviously the sales and everything's nice, but when you're, when you're in a constant state of rush and anxiety and mm. things are happening too quickly and eventually quality slips, it's what's the point? Yeah. You're basically created a business that you've become a slave to. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that was, yeah, that's kind of what happened. And so what did the LA, do, LA store do for the brand internationally? Oh, opportunities, 
um, it, it made us look like you know, a reputable international brand. International, uh, we, we got a license deal teed up in South Korea. Yeah. There's going to be free I Love Ugly stores. Free I Love Ugly stores in Seoul and the building and collaborations and this and that and just all sorts. Like people wanted to license the store like Sweden and this and Damn. that. And, and uh, it, it, it was crazy. And then we also collaboration. So we did a collaboration with Jansport Bags, mm. which was a huge success. On a Suka Tiger. Which so did they a, approach you for that? Or they approached us. Way? They were fans of a store. So we'd have, sure. you know, we'd have Justin Bieber come in and he'd buy, you know, 15 pairs of pants. Yeah, we'd have Zayn yeah. Malik. We'd have every stylist styling every dude you know of. You'd have, you know, uh, our boy Chester Watson. Uh, he'd come in, he'd do gigs, would do, would, we striked up a relationship with Sony Records and GZ would do in-store signings and there'd be, you know, yeah. 2,000 kids come through our store. And for that, in that sense, it was amazing. It was yeah. a public showroom. Yeah. But once again, we were focusing on all the things that looked cool and yeah. we weren't focusing on the things that make a business run and the things that are most important. Mm. Yeah, the financial, the operations, the, mm. you know, making, just making sure you got your, your shit together. We weren't focusing on that, and yeah, the rug slowly got pulled underneath us. And so, when did the um, you obviously did another big um, collab with Onisuka Tiger? Yeah. How did that work? Yeah, so basically, I went back to LA. I was constantly going back to LA because it was a 12 hour flight directly from Auckland City. And I just went over, met with the guys who were customers. We drove over to Orange County, went to, went to the headquarters, and met all the top dudes you know, from the US, glo US and global and yeah. picked a silhouette and um, just basically went from there and just tinkered with it. Yeah. And then we designed, did all the designing back in-house, back in Auckland with our team at the time. And yeah, just basically. What was it like, obviously, you know, starting from, you know, just the t-shirts that you were screen printing to the broken public, to the store, to, you know, collaborating with yeah. a brand you know, like that, like on a super tight. Yeah, it was phenomenal. Like, yeah, there was points where I'd have to pinch myself to make yeah. sure that this is real. But the fact that it was going too quickly was scary as well. Yeah, hyper growth but, can kill businesses. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. You know, you've got the problem of too little sales or too yeah. too fast sales. Yeah. We had, we had, you know, too, yeah, too fast. But yeah, it was it was phenomenal, you know. Um, yeah, and that's where you got to, you know, gratitude kind of kicks into place and you got to really look back yeah. retrospectively about what you've achieved and just be grateful because you're yeah. otherwise you're constantly chasing your tail and constantly want more 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 mm. and eventually you become tired yeah and so i had to you know i had to learn that, to learn so that skill. things are going really really well LA, yeah. well things are growing things yeah. are still growing quite rapidly. yeah it's going i retail. guess from a yeah from a public perspective it's going fantastic as and soon as so, we got to la as soon as we got back to la we got the retail store opening bug and we went to melbourne and repeated the same process <laughs> and that year we spent a million dollars on stores on stores stores travel gallivanting around the world right. growing a brand you know just everything it's a lot of money <laughs> yeah 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 i can only imagine uh, but when everything's going well you know yeah well a rising a rising tide lifts all yachts yeah yeah, and yeah. You know, when you're doing well, it kind of covers up all your scars and all your mistakes and all your shortfalls, and that's what was happening to us. Yeah. And then after Melbourne? After Melbourne, Sydney. And how, then, how long between those? Uh, so after Melbourne, maybe a couple of months, I believe. And then Sydney, a couple of months. So it was LA, Melbourne, Sydney, all within the same year. Yeah, and Sydney was a six-month pop-up. And we, so we wanted to test the waters. Yeah. And then it just started to get a little bit out of control. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so at what point do the cracks start beginning to show you know you're like something could be yeah. amiss here. well the cracks started to show when the bank was like saying guys your stock levels are way too high right you're growing too quickly and you're you haven't met your covenants for a few things right so basically you get a warning letter from the bank and it's like you got to fix this fix that yeah fix this you know, it's all so based on ratios. With this no, 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 no. I was, I was solely focused on oh, right, okay. the brand, supercharging yeah. this beast. Yeah, yeah. So and it now, was easy for you to look past for sure. all of that. And that's, you know, in hindsight, that was a huge mistake. Like, 
even if you're a, even if you are a designer or a creative, you still need to know what the hell's mm. going around on the business yeah, side. Baseline and, level. Yeah, and that's like me today. I'm a I know fully 100 percent 360 view of what's going on in the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I had to go through hell to to figure that to out. So yeah, we were you know I I I kind of I had a I had a faint idea because yeah. you'd hear your partner business partner talk about it and you know and then we had to go on sales and we we're overstocked yeah. and then you next minute you're dumping you're oversupplying a market yeah but the the best thing is when you're when you're the flavor of the month and you're the hot like a hot brand you basically stall demand yeah. you you hold back rather than supplying mm. supreme's a perfect example of this yeah. is you know they could say sell a thousand units of something but they still only produce 700 yeah. because they know it's going to create demand for the next time around and that's what we should have done and so um at what point does la close la closes and it was why? about it was about take me through that moment when you're like so basically this was the dream we went over there it was so cool yeah we were killing it everything's so going killing right it. and then yeah. what happened and then the ba basically the bank gave us a letter. Uh, it was 550 grand, 600 grand. Basically, they were gonna foreclose us right. because we had we basically hadn't met our covenants. And they said, "Hey, you have to pay back this money in seven days. Otherwise, we're foreclosing you." And yeah, basically, you are, you guys are screwed. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, it wasn't out of the blue. Yeah. There had been plenty of warning signs, right. signs early on, but we were just ignoring it. Right. We were just naively thinking everything will be all work itself out. Yeah. So it, was more, it wasn't more of a brand issue or what was going on externally to the customer, yeah. it was more the foundation. It was operational. Oh, yeah. okay. The brand was, as I said, Cranking. we had the Midas touch, but yeah. when you oversupply, you overproduce, yeah. you know, pushing, pushing play on a style, you know, adding a few extra zeros is easy. Um, yeah. Selling it is the damn hard part. Yeah, we were yeah. doing a good job at selling, but we were, yeah, we were just ordering too much. But so going back to your question, yeah, we got the got the letter, and yeah, just it was crazy. Retreat, yeah. I kind of got the letter, and I came back, and I walked up the ramp, and I was gonna make up some bullshit story to the staff about something, and I was like, I don't know why. But then just I told the truth and everybody appreciated it. And then, yeah, I was like, okay, there's one thing I know for sure is I'm not going to let this thing go. Yeah. I'm not going to quit. Mm. Like all the odds Which were against us. Which can be the hardest thing. Yeah. Well, you had, I had liquidators man. knocking on the door, everyone. And, you know, at the same time, yeah, they, they came to me and they said, look, I'm impressed. 99.9% 99 .9 of people would have run for the hills yeah. and you're here. I went to visit them and yeah. spoke to them face to face. What was it? What was it within you that was like, no, I'm not giving up? Like I, so at this point, I was deeply invested into motive, right. like self help, and yeah, and I had such a strong foundation. And every book I'd read about every great successful person at some point in their career reached yeah. this point. Yeah. And then I was like, huh, okay, well, this is my point. Moment. This is my defining moment. Yeah. This is for me to show my true colors and mm. to apply everything that I've been learning about this type of stuff. And, and I knew that it was no longer, a, it was no longer a, a thing about skills and tactics. It was all about my mindset and my yeah. psychology. So basically, usually, not everybody, but usually when people get in situations like this, they overeat, they stop exercising, yeah. they drink, they smoke weed, all this, rah 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 I went the complete opposite. I doubled, doubled down, down on my health. I ran, in, running, incantations. Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to fucking do this. I'm unstoppable, this, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I was doing the breathing. And then I'd come back. I'd come back into my house. And I'd just be like in this crazy electric state. Yeah. And that's when I was making all my decisions. Right. I always made sure that I didn't make a, a decision. Yeah. When I was in a bad, slumpy state, I always yeah. make sure I was in peak the peak state. So that's what got me out of it. And then, you know, don't get me wrong, the, the motivation and the hype did kind of wear off by the morning and water down. But I just still made sure of it. I'd just keep keep going through it. And I just basically just broke it all down. First thing I did is I shut down. We had to shut down the LA store, Melbourne, Sydney, 
the two Auckland stores, kept the ones that were really profitable, shut down all the distribution. New market and Wellington. And Wellington yeah. Shut down all the distribution, shut down all the wholesalers. If they wanted to buy the product, they had to pay for it up front. Yeah. Shut everything down, get rid of all this excess crap stock, just liquid everything, turn it into cash. I went to the bank, I said, hey look, I can't do it in seven days, but give me 30 days. Yeah. And I said, you're gonna get a better chance, have a better chance getting the money, money from back. me yeah. than someone else re taking over the company and trying to do it themselves. Yeah. No one's, and basically they agreed, obviously I did this for a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, they agreed, shut down, just shut it all down. Obviously it didn't happen overnight, it took yeah, months. Yeah, yeah. You know, the internet, everyone was saying, I love ugly as fuck, they're, they're closing down. Yeah. Their, you know, their, 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 luck, their luck has run out, this yeah. and that. Just had to ignore all that. Just basically put it on my- It pretty difficult though, when the world's saying to everybody in the media, everything, to all your fans, to your yeah. audience that, I love ugly's in trouble. Yeah. You know, they're potentially gonna close yeah. fully. Yeah. How do you, like, how do you deal with that though? Well, first thing is you need a, Tight support group. Unfortunately, yeah. I had my wife. I had, yeah, my my family. It's a common thing, very, right? Yeah, like, the importance. Of yeah, the absolutely. You either get further apart or you get closer. Yeah. In my case, I was lucky, and I got I got closer. And that paired with like with me doubling down on myself and yeah, yeah my my mindset and just my personal well being, just dealt with it. And I just I just made sure that I was hundred percent honest and transparent with every creditor, yeah. every supplier, every staff member. And then yeah. the people So you had taken the reins at this point. I took yeah. the reins. People left, like a lot of people left, yeah. but the, the, a lot of people stayed. Yeah. And then we basically wrote an open letter to our audience and gave them a gave them a breakdown of what was happening. Because yeah, yeah, the media yeah. was saying this is two thousand seventeen. Two thousand seventeen. Yeah. And then I, I had to. I basically sold, you know. I had to re remortgage my house, Damn. sell sell my car, yeah. sell everything I had, and then I had to incur. What did, the, what did the wife think of that? My wife was. The whole time, my wife believed in yeah. me, which kind of pissed me off. <laughs> yeah, because. It kind of, yeah, she just said, well, you'll sort it out. Yeah, yeah. You'll Which sort is it hard. out. Yeah, very it's, hard. Yeah, it's very hard. It's not as easy as you'll sort it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was just like, that was just a kick in the ass. And then, um, yeah, I just sold it all and then remortgaged the house. Hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars a day. I had to borrow, borrow money. Um, I had to borrow more money. At, at the same time, I had to buy my business partner yeah. out. I had to pay off creditors. I had to like just to plead to people they wouldn't take me to, yeah. debt, you know, to debt collectors because yeah. you know, I'm gonna, and I told them, I was like, look, I'm gonna man up and I'm gonna pay for this, but it's gonna probably take you three, yeah. four years and you just have to be patient. But you, at the same time, you need to trust me. Yeah. I did that and then I, yeah, April 2017, I, I officially took over. I was the official owner. Yeah. And um, that's when, you know, when I signed the paper, I was like, Fuck, I cannot, can't, it wasn't over, by all means. Yeah, 2017 yeah, yeah. to 2018 was chaos. Hit it was it, yeah. it was excruciating, it was painful. Like, I felt I aged 20 years. Yeah, yeah, I fought yeah. multiple times, I thought I was gonna have a heart attack, but <laughs> I, um, yeah, I got through it and then I, I had onto my house for a year and then I had to sell my house and, and cause I couldn't, I was yeah. so heavily mortgaged, I couldn't afford the repayments and it was straining the business with my salary to, yeah pay for the house, I got rid of that and moved into a little two bedroom granny flat. I was living yeah. in this beautiful suburban area in Titarangi, Auckland, West Auckland, overlooking the ocean and beautiful and to selling that, selling my, you know, had the dope car and all this shit, yeah. I sold all that to basically living in a two bedroom flat with no one, you know, two bedroom mm. granny flat, completely just stripped me of all ego and everything and then yeah. I basically got to that point and had to recuperate yeah. and um, yeah. And do you think, like, w would you do, looking back on how everything was r run um, up until that point, like, what would you do differently? I would not be afraid to spend the money on a financial controller yeah. that would basically tell us to reel it in. Yeah, yeah. I would, if it was getting too fast to the point where decisions were being made without me even knowing about it. Yeah. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be doing that. Yeah. I would 
have not, yeah, obviously not grown as quickly. I would have kept the team tighter. I would have focused on the important things, not the fancy things. Yeah. Yeah, as opposed to spending copious amounts of money on a New York PR show or a PR agency to give you press. I would have rather spent that money on a merchandise manager to, yeah. to watch our watch our stock. So kind of what you're saying is even if you are skilled in one kind of area, you're saying don't just stick to that and kind of shut shut out the rest of it. It's kind yeah. of even if you don't like it, so the accounting or whatever, even yeah. if you don't like these other areas of the business, you're saying get a baseline level of all these things so you have an idea of what's yeah. going on. Get a, have an idea of what's going on right. and get a person an amazing person yeah. who you can trust and who's yeah. just got got the skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you need to, uh, uh, even if you're, no matter what business you're starting, fashion business, coaching business, yeah, even if you're an athlete, athletes, yeah. you need to know how to manage your money. You need to yeah. invest your money, your time. You need to know, learn to say no to a lot of opportunities. Yeah. These are all basic fundamental skills as yeah. a business person that you yeah. need to know. And I neglected all those and I made the fatal mistake of thinking, yeah. it wasn't fatal, I made a stupid mistake of yeah. thinking that I could create my way out of everything yeah, yeah, while yeah. neglecting all the other stuff just because I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Most of the times you don't enjoy something because you don't mm. know much about it. Yeah. So I just basically upskilled myself around it. Right, and so you kind of refocus, you kind of replay and re-strategize with everything. At what point do you start to say, okay, you know, we're not out of the woods yet, but I can begin to see a bit more daylight and like there is, I, I made the right decision. You know, there is a future here still. Yeah, so it took from April 2017 to probably late 2018. Yeah. Till I actually started to my confidence started to come back. Yeah, yeah. Prior yeah. to that, I was I was like a scared little puppy dog walking around with my tail between my legs most of the time. Yeah. Afraid to do anything somewhat risky, even yeah. if it wasn't, even if it wasn't going to like, you know, lose the business over it. Yeah. I was afraid to do anything. Yeah. Because I was scared of failure. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. as soon as I started to kind of get my confidence back, and then I, I, yeah, my wife and I, we went over to Tony Robbins and just did that yeah. you know, five day course. And I was like, boom, man, I got to, if I actually want to take this thing forward a little bit, yeah. I need to start taking a bit of healthy risk, not stupid yeah, yeah, risk, yeah. healthy risk. And we, I just went back to the basics and I stripped away everything and our revenue, you know, we were doing, you know, we were doing, it was, it was a big business. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we halved, less than half our revenue. Yeah. And I didn't really care because I wasn't really focused on it. I was just focused on creating something that was long-term sustainable. And yeah. 2000, late 2018, I started to kind of see the light. And then there's a guy who's my now current business partner, Nick, and he kind of came along and we started, he started to take care of all the operational stuff. And right. then I just started to really take my time on hiring people that were really good. Prior to that, I'd hire people that were okay yeah. and expect them to do uh, exceptional job, yeah. but still pay them an okay pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I took the, I took a risk of paying more money and getting people that were really experienced and specialists in certain areas, mm. and just upskilled the whole business. And I, a, a whole bunch of people got got it gutted out yeah. during the process, and then a whole bunch of new blood came in, and even like yourself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so. Okay, you you know we're at the kind of the end of 2018. What's like, you're obviously reinventing I Love Ugly, right, from yeah. the ground up. Yeah. Um, literally. Um, what what's the what's the game plan moving forward? The game plan is to basically stick to online. Yeah. Our, we're an we're an online business. Our I've got a very clear goal. We want to be the best online menswear brand in Australia. New Zealand and America. So that's the first thing. By having a clear goal, when you have opportunities or you need to make a decision, you just gotta make sure that it's in line with your goal. Yeah. So that's made a huge difference to me in the last 12 months or so because a lot of the decisions I've made have been mm. to achieve that goal. Yeah. And then with online, it's like, okay, cool, we need an online specialist. And I got, you know, obviously got yourself come on board and what we're doing differently now is like, okay, let's, if we're focusing on, if we're focusing on one thing, 
we're going to do a far better job on it. Yeah. But let's also do something a little bit differently to what we were doing last time because the worst thing we could do is try to do what we did last time yeah. and almost expect the same, same result, result because the world's moved so it's, it's, so quickly yeah, in the last so few rapidly. years. Now, you know, we can't just put a, a dope photo from an amazing photographer on Instagram and expect <laughs> to sell pants. Yeah, yeah, we can't yeah. do that anymore. We need to look at ourselves as a, almost like a voice, almost a media company. Yeah. So what we're doing going forward is we're actually starting to behave like a, like a mature, mature online data-driven yeah. business that actually gives our customers value beyond what's expected from yeah. a fashion brand. We do almost don't even look at, look at ourselves as a fashion brand. Yeah. Sure, we make products, but we, we basically want to give value first. We spend a lot of time, as, as opposed to spending all our time acquiring new customers, we spend a shitload of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort on retaining the current mm. customers we've got and giving them an exceptional service. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is when you do that and you focus on retaining a customer, your business regr- grows as a result of it, yeah. which sa- seems very, really counterintuitive, but that's natural tendency for people to think, grow, 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 new, new, new. Yeah. But actually, if you just hold and nurture and keep what you got, yeah that's going to start to, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. It's going to kind of grow. I it's mean, gonna... it's what's the point of acquiring all these new customers if you've got a sinking ship? Exactly. You know, a whole so we boat. basically, you know, for a long, a lot of period, and that's I know that's what you and me have worked hard with mm. is, and, you know, our operations and just everything, our production, we've just basically plugged all the holes, patched up all the holes, and now we've built a brand new ship. Yeah. And, yeah, we're in an exciting phase. Yeah, it is indeed an exciting phase. Yeah, it's... And, Obviously, we put out a lot of content that is kind of doesn't have anything to do with clothing. Yeah. Um, can you explain a little bit around that, around why that why that's important for us? Well, I love Ugly's mission is to inspire our customers to achieve their aspirations. Yeah. And I think that nowadays people are buying into a, a vision yeah. rather than buying into what you do yeah. or what you make. Yeah. And. I think it's important because it kind of it gives you cut for yeah. and you can penetrate different markets through using different mediums and different messages. Mm. People are going to go into a shop or they're going to go online and they're going to see 50 different white t-shirts. Yeah. Why are they going to buy Isle of Ugly? Yeah. But not, you know, fuck, it's a white t-shirt with our brand on yeah, it. Yeah. It's not exactly like people design want to innovation. To something. Yeah, yeah, people are going to look buy it because it make, makes them feel different. Yeah. So I think that's why we do what we do is we try to change the way people feel. Yeah. You know, we want to inspire people. So when they're having a shitty day or they're wanting to chase their dreams and they're just exactly what I was 10 years ago. Yeah. I want to create a brand that people can go to and mm. gravitate towards when they need that boost and we've got their back and we're supportive and we're open book and we'll give, you know, we released a document last week uh, how to make a million dollars selling clothes. Yeah. We basically gave away all our Which secrets. Which might seem kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people a- out Absolutely. There. Like, what, you know, people are like, what the heck? Why would you, why it's would like you Coca-Cola giving away their recipe. Like, yeah. obviously it's not that extreme, but because we just want to give value and go, go over and beyond. And it's a huge passion of mine. there's no mind. scarcity mindset. Absolutely. And you got to live in abundance mindset. And that's the mistake I've been making, you know, 12 months ago. I was, I was scared. I was, yeah. you know, I was cooped up. And yeah, you don't make any mistakes and you're just in a mm. safe little box. But at the same time, you don't grow. And growth is all around failure and experimentation yeah. and learning, learning about what you did wrong so you can improve going forward and build upon, you know, your, you know, all your successes are going to be built upon failures. And yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we, yeah, that's, that's, that's my perspective, what I'm passionate about. And, you know, we're investing heavily into it. And that's, that's the reason why we're doing this podcast and having yeah. this conversation to tell people the story and also to try be a real life example that if you've got a dream and a vision and a hunger, you can turn around a little bedroom brand into a multi-million dollar multi-million dollar business yeah and that's um yeah that's my that's what drives me that's sick and so obviously getting to the 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 10 year anniversary recently um that's a massive massive milestone you know you are an outlier yeah um in that sense what does that what does that mean to you getting to your 10 year anniversary it's business yeah it's phenomenal it's not only for myself it's for our customers as well because we wouldn't actually be here if it wasn't for them 
because they've all got choices. As I said, there's 50 other brands they could have bought yeah, for, yeah. but they stuck by us. And so it's, it's, it's you guys that are listening to this that have helped us get to that point. Technically, we're actually over 10 years, yeah, yeah. but last year we didn't celebrate it because we felt that we didn't have that infrastructure and we didn't yeah. have, yeah, we didn't have the baseline ready to do yeah. something a little bit out of the box. So this year it felt right. But what it means to me is, man, just even doing this little, doing this little podcast session about the history of Isle of Ugly, it's yeah. from you know 10 years ago, uh, you know, 10, 10, 10 plus years ago to yeah. where we are today. Where I am even today personally is it's it's huge and now I just want to make my mess my message and yeah. just you know as I said just tell the tale and give people the the confidence and the kind of tools and tactics to be able to also do the same thing. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, I love ugly is a very very cool story and I know personally that you've inspired a lot of people um, and I have no doubt that this decade anniversary won't be the last. Yeah, absolutely, um, man. But like clo in closing, kind of, what do you, when you look back, what do you want uh, I Love Ugly to be remembered as and by? Hmm. I almost want I Love Ugly to remember, be remembered by people. And I'm not, you know, when I, when I talk success, it doesn't mean you know, having the big house and this and that, but for people, a whole bunch of people to come to a point in their life and they made a decision because of I Love Ugly. Yeah. I Love Ugly helped them make that decision. It was a tough decision, yeah. but we gave them the confidence to make that decision. Mm. And then the exciting thing about that is clothing is just the start. Like we yeah. can we can expand beyond anything. Yeah. Like we're doing, yeah, we're doing podcasts. What we're doing right now. Yeah, we're we're a media company essentially. We could do I Love Ugly TV, and yeah, I'd I'd love for it to be remembered by that. And I know that there's a lot of nostalgia, and yeah. you know, people people kind of look back and have a lot of their own personal memories in the last decade yeah. associated with I Love Ugly, and that's what we always that's always what I always wanted to do. You know, I'm from a big family and. It's all about family vibes and just make this company Absolutely. super super inclusive and, and special. And I always like to ask myself if I Love Ugly, if my company died tomorrow, would people miss it? Yeah. And I'm always trying to make it. So mm. if it was dead, be dead tomorrow, people would miss the crap out of it. That's sick. I mean, that's an amazing yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, that kind of comes to the end of it. Um, awesome. Any closing words? Yeah, just... Obviously, this we can't fit. The, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot more that we could have. Absolutely, fit in, yeah, and we'll um, get there. But this is, years, yeah, yeah, this is the first first episode of a podcast, and this is a brand new journey. This has been, you know, a personal. Personally, I've been wanting to do this for two years, but, and that's what I've really learned as I've gone along is, you can do the right thing in the wrong time, yeah. and it could it can flop. But you got to make sure that you're doing things at the right time, and this was the right time, and. Yeah, this is a this is going to be another exciting journey. This podcast and where it can go, and all excited about the guests and the people that are gravitating towards it. Yeah, so, and I can't good. wait to learn more. Yeah, so, cool. um, yeah, man. Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and found any type of value, please subscribe to our podcast, share with your friends, and give us a five star review on iTunes to be in the draw to win a two hundred dollar I Love Ugly gift voucher. We will be drawing a winner weekly. Good luck and see you on the next episode.